Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Areli. I am a medical doctor, pathologist, neuropathologist, and I also have a certification in plant-based nutrition. I've been eating a plant-based exclusive diet, meaning no animal products since 2013. So that makes me a uh, vegan for over 10 years. And from 2018 to 2023, five years, I ate an exclusive raw vegan diet. And the reason why I changed my diet since February of 2023, it's been over a little bit over a year that I am now a high raw vegan. The reason for that is because it's easier to get access to protein in the form of cooked or processed form. Again, still vegan, still high carb, but now I consume, I would say, moderately high or moderate amount of protein, not so high. It constitutes 20% of my calories at the moment. 60, 65% of my calories is co coming from, from carbs and around 15 to 18, sometimes 20% uh, from fats. So this is my current macro, macro distribution. And the reason for that change was explained in my previous video. If you haven't watched it, uh, there is a masterclass here in my YouTube channel which is a summary of the very first newsletter that I wrote. So the people who are subscribed to my newsletter, they receive it first before I did the summary in a YouTube format. Uh, if you're interested in knowing the topic of the second newsletter, and if you want to read it before anybody else and before I make a YouTube video, it was already distributed to my subscribers. So I encourage you, if you are interested in knowing the things that I no longer do and I no longer recommend, as a former exclusive raw vegan eater. So that's the topic of the second newsletter. You can get access by subscribing to it. It's on my website. Everything that I discuss here in this video is gonna be shared in the description box. So you go to my website, drorelli.com, and then you subscribe. You confirm in your spam that you receive uh, an email from info at drorelli.com. Please click the link that says confirm subscription. And again, check your spam because sometimes you know it's difficult to get access to your inbox through uh, my newsletter distribution system. I still need to fix that issue. But if you want to get access to that, uh, because I don't know when I'm gonna make a video, um, you can get access to it by subscribing. So I encourage you to subscribe. Now, before I make this second video, uh, the things that I no longer do, no longer recommend as a former raw vegan exclusive eater, I consider important to revisit one of my interviews that I did with Eva Loves Raw. Eva Loves Raw, also has realized the importance of increasing our protein, especially as we age. Um, and we did a very good interview, a very nice conversation the other day. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna watch with you the video because some of the answers that I gave her, uh, when I rewatched the video, I really wanted to expand on or some of the answer I didn't like, or I feel like I, I fall short. So I feel like, well, you know, let's play the video and let's make some commentary over the video. So that's my plan for today. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the video and I'm gonna speed it up to 1.5 so we don't spend more than two hours here because it's a long it's a long interview. So this video is probably long. If you don't wanna watch it because everybody's busy, right? If you listen to it, you can learn something and uh, yeah, let's do it. If I'll play the video and I'll stop when I need to make a commentary. And I can't wait to get started. Hi, Aureli, how are you today? Hi, you are great. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm excited, let's do it. Yes, let's do it. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit is uh, why is protein such a trigger word for vegans and raw vegans? We covered this a little bit uh, last time, but I really have gotten a lot of pushback from a lot of overzealous vegans and raw vegans saying this is not an important macro. I guess there's a lot of people on the 80-10-10 camp, and it really seems like people's minds are very closed when it comes to protein. Why do you think that is? Okay, this is, uh, I have probably three answers. But I would say that the most important thing is a, um, a matter of identity and belief system. So if you attach the way you eat, the way you behave, the way you act in society and the way you live your life to an identity, to a label. And if somebody criticizes certain aspect of that lifestyle, that means a personal attack to you. I remember when I was a hardcore Christian, you know, my, my family still is, uh, but I was, um, yeah, very, very heavy in, in that belief system. I used to believe that everybody else was lost in, you know, in the day of judgment and we will be the ones who are gonna be saved. So that aspect, you know, attack to your identity is one aspect. The other one is uh, if we take something like to the core and becomes part of our belief system, making it almost like a religion, it could also be something that uh, blurs our mind and don't let us see beyond and have develop a critical mindset and say, hey, let's question my belief systems. The other one is actually um, about ethics because we have heard multiple times from multiple people that we are frugivores, right? Even Dr. Greger says we are frugivores. So what, what's the meaning of frugivore? Is a species, uh, mammals in this case, uh, homo, in our case, homo sapiens, that eats 
predominantly fruit. It's not exclusively fruit. I guess there is like a semantics problem or definitions problem. Like if you take the, the term fruitivore and if you put it uh, online, like in, in a real dictionary, it's not, the definition is not only fruit, it's predominantly fruit. Mm. So coming from that background, the origin of the word fruitivore is like, okay, so if we are not exclusive fruitivores, what is the other little percentage that, or what is, yeah, what is the room that we leave for other type of food? And I would say that maybe we are flexible fruitivores giving room for animal products. And again, you know, this goes beyond ethics. This is just taxonomy, biology. And um, I feel like once we accept that fact, there's not a lot of conflict because when you accept that biological fact, that doesn't make you less vegan. Quite the contrary, actually makes you more conscious that you're making an ethical decision to, despite our anthropology, making us flexible fruitivores. Uh, you consciously make a choice. I'm not going to eat animal products. I can get my protein sources from other from plants, right? I just have to be, become more intelligent, more selective, use more strategy to get those plant-based uh, proteins rather than relying on animal products. So yeah, it's, it's a matter of identity and, you know, erasing belief systems and probably changing our mind. And, you know, it's, 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 it's an attack to our identity. I think that's the main reason. And also another one is about uh, debate against vegans. For example, we have fought so hard to make people understand that plants have protein, okay? Mm -hmm. Everything has protein. A banana has protein, lettuce has protein, rice has protein, um, watermelon has protein. The problem is the quantities. So mm -hmm. watermelon, uh, 100 grams, has less than one gram of protein. Don't quote me on this, but it's very little. One banana has one gram of protein. Mm -hmm. Compared to you know a, a piece of chicken or, or steak or whatever, probably has 20 to 30 grams of protein. So don't when we say let's eat more protein just for the sake, let's eat more plants just for the sake of increasing our protein, that means that you're going to be eating huge amounts of plant-based, especially fruits, if you're basing your, your calorie sources from fruit, just to reach 20 or 30 grams of protein. So mm -hmm. if you want to defend from a caloric perspective, that protein approach, you need to take into consideration that the grams, the quantities really matter. Mm -hmm. So we have fought so hard against carnivores, omnivores who attack veganism to say plants have protein. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I guess the question from the other side is like, but how much you're getting out of plants? How much protein? Not that plants don't have it. And then the other one is like uh, terminology. Uh, many people are confused and they say, we don't need protein, we need amino acids. Yes. But again, how many grams of amino acids? We use it interchangeably. Proteins, amino acids. How many grams of amino acids or proteins is in a banana versus how many grams or protein is in a piece of chicken. Mm -hmm. And if we compare it with a plant-based source that is not necessarily a fruit, for example, cook lentils, a cook or a bowl of cooked lentils that has 10 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we need to, I, I feel like we don't look very smart if we just throw the pre premeditated phrase, like we don't need protein, plants have amino acids, that's all they need. Or, oh, but animals, the strongest animals, the gorillas and the rhinos, you know, they're very muscular and they eat lots of ve vegetation mm -hmm. and they have plenty of protein. Yes, but if you put in Wikipedia, how many pounds of foliage a gorilla eats it's impossible that we can eat that much just to get 200 grams of protein, which is an actual amount that a gorilla eats. So yeah. it's from all fronts that we get triggered, identity, religious, belief system, um, defending us against only wars, carnivores that throw the, the most annoying phrase, where do you get your protein? Yeah. <laughs> you know. So yeah. that's I, I guess that's a way to explain why we get so triggered. Yeah, yeah, I love what you're saying. There is a lot of catchphrases that actually they're not based on anything other than I think maybe opinion in some cases. There are a lot of catchphrases. Um, and I was so Eva asked me, what do you think there is a lot of resistance and it's a matter of getting triggered whenever we hear like you're not getting enough protein as a vegan or raw vegan. So in a nutshell, what I could hear myself saying here, I would say that there is, I can detect at the moment four reasons why we get so triggered as vegans or raw vegans. One would be about semantics and definitions. The other would be about belief systems and identity. The third reason it will be because we have we have fought so hard to make our voices be understood that plants have protein so defending that concept plants have protein and revisiting the fact that probably we're not getting enough protein as raw vegans or vegans uh that's also like there is resistance against something that we have fought so hard for and the fourth reason why there is a lot of um resistance to embrace this you know thing that i think i discovered is confusion about the terminology what is protein and what is amino acids so i'm going to address the four of them semantics dr gregor has a video about the taxonomy of humans taxonomy is how uh, biologists anthropologists and other scientists classify humans uh, we belong to, to the animal kingdom right and in the animal kingdom you have mammals you have all sorts of things we are mammals and we are primates so Primates are frugivores, and we belong to that category of primates. We are automatically classified as frugivores. Now, understanding what, what's the meaning of frugivore is not difficult. You can go to Wikipedia. You can go to any anthropological website, any university website, biology, and type 
type the definition of frugivore, and you will find that the definition of frugivore doesn't mean exclusive fruit eating. So I think that's a confusion. And I mean, I've heard the term, the term fruitarian for people that adopt a lifestyle uh, where they only eat fruit. So at the beginning, I didn't pay attention to that because I always believed that fruit has protein, right? So why should we bother about the consumption of protein from our fruits? I Now I don't believe that way. I believe that if you base your diet on fruits only, uh, maybe you're falling short on protein, unless you, are, you eat tons of fruits just to fulfill your protein requirements. But I explained in my first newsletter that that's something that I don't want to do because that defies the purpose of eating a diet that fulfills your, your caloric needs. So otherwise you're gonna get overweight if you eat extra calories. At this point, I feel like everybody should understand that calories matter, no matter where they're coming from. Like if you overeat fruit, you're gonna gain weight, right? So that's another topic, uh, but semantically speaking, frugivore doesn't mean eating fruit only. Frugivore means, yes, our diet should be based on fruits, uh, but other things too. So if you go to any website that describes what is a diet of a bonobo or a chimpanzee or a gorilla, you're gonna find something surprising facts, some, some surprising facts that definitely make you think. And they probably eat 65% of their diet out of fruits, but they also eat plenty of leafy greens and they also eat plenty of insects. And sometimes they gather to go and hunt smaller monkeys, for example. So that really broke my heart when I discovered that. And if we disregard that important fact about frugivorism, um, I think that we're missing the point. Like, why are we cherry picking the fact that, oh yeah, they're frugivores, we should all also be frugivores and uh, you know, um, disregard everything else. I think that that's when we are falling short and we see it. I mean, don't let me um, start, but I can put a list of people who have gone through the fruitarian, exclusive fruitarian lifestyle and they don't, they don't make it. I don't see many people standing strong and not only, not only just leaving, but also thriving. I haven't seen that. Um, I'm talking about fruit eating only. Okay. There are so many raw vegans that base their, their diet on fruit, mostly fruit, but they also include leafy greens. They also include uh, nuts and seeds. They also include uh, probably sprouts. So I'm not talking about that category of raw vegans. I'm talking about the fruitarians exclusive. And um, I mean, no offense to anyone who follows this diet, but I would ask you, um, have you seen any fruitarian that has a nine to five and has children and has most of the fruitarians is because they are probably like digital nomads and they don't have children and probably can spend most of their time trying to chase fruit. And that's something very laborious, if you ask me. So, you know, a lot of controversy. I'm nobody to judge people who are doing that. But to say that we are truly or exclusive because our cousins, the primate, do it too, I think that that's incorrect. So we are talking about definitions and semantics. The other thing why we get triggered when we listen to the word protein as raw vegans or, or, or vegans is because belief systems and, and identity. I explained to Eva Love Raw here in the video that imagine me getting rid of my label raw vegan doctor. I was thinking about building something out of that name, raw vegan doctor, right? Imagine getting rid of that label once you dis once I discovered that, you know, maybe we're falling short on protein and in order to achieve more consumption of protein, I need to be honest and I need to be transparent. So the raw vegan label no longer suits me, not because the people who are following a raw vegan lifestyle, the ones that are doing it more sustainably, uh, not because I have anything against them. It's because for my fitness goals, this is something that I recently discovered and I've been implementing for my fitness goals to build muscle easily, put on muscle and keep the muscle. Uh, and it's not only muscle, it's also bone density. So many other things, soft tissue, ligaments, cartilage, joints, all of that structure, those structural components of our bodies is made of protein. So when I realized that, that my fitness goals change, that's what made me reconsider everything that I've been implementing. And I can see the results out of increasing my protein amounts in my workouts, in keeping the muscle mass that I've gained, um, and not compromising other structures in my body. You know, I still keep healthy hair, healthy nails, a healthy skin, healthy joints. I recover. So, uh, so many things. I, I need to make a video about the changes that I've seen after eating this way for over a year. But that's one of the things that I wanted to expand on uh, in this video that 
when I refer to get, we get triggered by belief systems and identity, I feel like the ego is a very uh, difficult thing to to bend or to modify or to adjust to to change. We are we resist change by nature, especially if you don't have anything that is uh, compelling enough for you to make a change. In my case, it was, which is fitness fitness goals, body recomposition goals, and I can see that is is making a positive effect in my body and in my health overall. So that's the second reason. The other reason is because, as I said, we have had so hard to make our voices get heard in the omnivore world. Like when we get the annoying question, where do you get your protein? We need to reply, plants have protein, right? I guess the question that it comes from the carnivore and omnivore tribe is like, okay, yes, plants have protein, but how much you're getting out of your plants or your plant-based diet? So you wouldn't let me lie. Most bodybuilders that are vegan, they eat protein supplementation to keep that physique. And I know that there's some raw vegans exclusive that say that, hey, you can put on muscle if you are uh, raw vegan. And that response usually comes from men that are young. So as women, as we get older, it's difficult to put on muscle on a raw vegan exclusive diet if you don't increase the amount of protein. So that's something that so many women have written to me and they have expressed the same kind of like aha moment. Like, yeah, you know, I have changed my diet. I have increased my protein and I can see that it's making a difference. I feel like there is a confusion um, when it comes to defining how much protein we're getting out of plants and just stating that we don't worry about protein because plants have protein. One thing is, yes, plants have protein, but how much protein we're getting out of our plants. And if you have never tracked yourself, you wouldn't understand my point of view uh, and why I'm trying to raise awareness. Not because I want to be annoying. I mean, there is resistance. If something has been working for you for a long time and somebody out of nowhere <laughs> comes and tells you, pay attention, pay attention to the protein, the amount of protein that you are ingesting out of your plants, because maybe you're falling short. Nobody likes to track themselves. Uh, nobody likes to do math. Nobody likes to go the extra mile and see if they're actually getting all the nutrition. Because it's tedious. Unless you have fitness goals, which I had and I still have, um, I feel that tracking myself, tracking my nutrition for a certain amount of time gave me a very good understanding of what I was doing. So the question is, or the answer to the question, where do you get your protein shouldn't be only, oh, I get it from plants. It should be more like, I get it from plants. And the plant sources that are rich in protein are this and this and this and this. And I eat plenty of them to just satisfy my protein requirements, right? So that's another thing why we get triggered. Because, yeah, it's, it's the amount. The last or the fourth thing that I mentioned is that there is confusion. Like people say, oh, we don't need protein. We need amino acids. I broke down every single terminology and, and why it matters not to get confused in my first newsletter. And you can watch it in the YouTube video that I made as a summary, uh, a masterclass on protein. But basically, we, we shouldn't be giving that automatic answer because it doesn't sound very knowledgeable if you say, oh, you know, we don't need, we don't need protein. We need amino acids. We're talking about the same thing. If somebody asks you, how do you, how do you build a house? Well, somebody's going to say, well, you need walls. You need walls to delineate the house. And somebody is going to say, no, I only need bricks. I only need bricks to build a house. I don't need the walls. I need the bricks. And this store, the store of plants gives me the bricks. And that's all I need. But the ones who say, no, we need walls. Let's go to the store that sells walls. There is a lot of conflict, right? Because one person believes that you only need bricks. And you just need to go to the store, which is the plant sources that sells bricks. And the other person says, no, actually, you know, we need bigger things. <laughs> we, need, we, need, we need the wall. And maybe if we don't like the size of the wall that is already pre-made, maybe we can chisel it with hammer or something. And we can adapt it to the size of the house that we want to build. So that's exactly how it sounds when somebody who says, let's not go to the store that sells walls. Let's just go to the store that sells the bricks. That's how it sounds when you say, we don't need proteins, we need amino acids. Protein meaning walls, amino acids meaning breaks. It's the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. The people who tell you that we don't need breaks, we need walls, are the omnivores and the carnivores. They're saying, actually, you know, this wall has 
plenty of amino acids and some amino acids are stronger than others. And these amino acids are in charge of building muscle. This wall has all of the amino acids uh, where if you go to the store that only sells bricks, maybe you're going to get one type of brick and that's it, which is a myth. You know, plants have all the amino acids. It's just the amount. Sometimes we need the full wall rather than a little box of amino acids. So probably a chicken breast has a hundred bricks. So they sell you the, the, the whole wall and a cup of blueberries has only 20 bricks. Still has amino acids, right? Still has the components of the constituents of protein, but it doesn't have a hundred. So that's the thing. Uh, so I invite you to whenever you want to respond to, oh, we don't need protein, we need amino acids. We're talking about the same thing. So the body has a capacity to break down the wall to assimilate the amino acids or the bricks. And the body also has a capacity to just ingest bricks in a simple form and build proteins out of it. So both camps are a little bit confused. And if we know these things, I feel like there shouldn't be any fight. But anyways, let's keep watching. Let's keep watching. I was told this when I changed my diet, as I've shared with you, as I've shared with my viewers, I changed my diet to include more protein. And therefore, I started eating some cooked food, beans and lentils and things like this. Then people would just tell me, why don't you just eat more calories? Um, and Because I don't want to eat more calories because no. calories do matter. So if I'm eating more calories in order to get more protein, it's like it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So I'm, I'm going to eat 4000 calories a day in order to get more protein. So what do you have to say about that argument? Just up your up your calories, eat more. I think we need to become more educated rather than throwing that phrase that we learn from many other people. You have to be educated enough to know that one gram of protein gives you four calories. One gram of carbs gives you four calories. One gram of fat gives you nine calories. So if I, I I'm going to put myself as an example, my particular needs, caloric needs because of my body size, my gender, my activity, activity levels and fitness goals, I need around 2000 calories more or less to maintain my lean physique on top of that. To keep my brain functioning properly because the brain runs on, on, on sugars right uh, ketones as well but that's another topic um we need also to i need also those 2000 calories to keep myself moving just walking normally i need those calories to keep my reproductive health on point mm -hmm. so if i if i increase my calories to 4000 just for the sake of increasing my protein just to keep it raw just to keep it fruit based yeah precise and petite mm -hmm. that means that i will earn more calories which is going to be transformed into fat because you need to know a little bit of biochemistry you don't need to be a master's or a doctorate in biochemistry no it's just understand that Excess carbs, even though it's, it's plant-based, even though it's raw, really matters because every gram of carbs is going to give you four calories, sorry. Every gram of carbs, four calories. Every mm -hmm. gram of protein, four calories. So if in order for me to keep a 2,000 calorie diet, which is to keep myself at my base and functional, mm -hmm. I would rather tweak the macros and increase the protein and yeah. lower the carbs a little bit. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, people, you know, you have to understand, you're still keeping it high carb, low fat, low protein, proportion-wise. Mm -hmm. Before, I used to eat, you know, 85, sometimes 75, sometimes 90 percent of my calories from, from carbs. But now I eat 65. 60 to 70, 65 average carbs, while I'm still eating low protein, if you want to call it like, like that way, I would call it low moderate protein, which mm -hmm. I keep my protein beyond 15, 15 to 20% of my calories. And that's what science says, you know, you don't need to go crazy on protein. It's not like we're eating a high protein diet. People mm -hmm. think that 60%, 80% of our calories are coming from protein. That's not the case. Yeah. Yeah. So just raising awareness that those percentages really matter. And if you're eating 10% protein versus 20% protein, that really makes a difference. Yeah. But yeah. the calories are kept at the same level because it's the same yeah. as carbs. Yeah, you're just changing your macros, which makes so yeah. much sense. Like, I don't know why this didn't dawn on me when I was trying to change my body. We talked about this, my body composition. Um, I was getting skinny fat and I could. So, yeah, just balance your macros. So uh, how many grams of protein are you then getting yourself per day? Time yeah, so because, again, I have a full time job. I work out almost every day, heavy, intense workouts. Uh, and I at the same time, I want to keep my calories uh, at 2000. Uh, I am between 80 grams and above. Anything above 80 to 100 is, is, is great for me. If you are someone who wants to keep it raw, vegan, uh, you can easily reach 60 grams of protein as a raw vegan, not necessarily fruit based. Mm. Focusing more on seeds, focusing more on uh, sprouts, focusing more on plenty of leafy greens. Yeah. And we're, talk we're talking about tender leafy greens like romaine lettuce, you know, but not necessarily kale. Uh, but yeah, um, but right now, because I'm high raw vegan, and because as we explained in the previous video, and just to refresh people's memory, one block of tempeh, which is germinated soybeans, is going to give me 25 grams of protein and only 100 to 150 calories. Yeah. If I want to obtain those 25 grams of protein from bananas alone, I will need to eat 25 bananas. Yeah. That's 25 bananas going to give me 2,500 calories. Yeah. So it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make yeah. sense. So I guess the question is, can you just answer this a little bit, but can you get enough protein on a fully raw vegan diet? But and you just said, yes, you can, but then you have to up the fat, but then wouldn't the fat be a little too high, which is what I was finding as I was trying to eat a little bit more protein. There are no many great sources of protein that are also at the same time, high fat, because you're looking at. Let's pause here. Let's address the requirements for protein. So there is so many studies that have been done in the past. And one of the most accurate is to determine the nitrogen balance in our bodies meaning 
the nitrogen that gets in should be the same that the nitrogen that gets out. Uh, and that's a way to know that you are in balance, meaning that you are not lacking protein because protein is a molecule that has a lot of nitrogen um, in the in the molecular structure. So those studies were used to determine the amount of protein for humans. It changes uh, according to your age. Uh, it varies if you're a, a kid, an infant, if you are an adolescent, an adult, or if you are older. So in a nutshell, the dietary... Uh, recommended dietary allowance, which is RDA, is estimated to be around 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilo of body weight. Just do the math. If you are somebody that weighs 50 kilos, 50 times 0 0.8, that's gonna be 40 grams of protein, right? According to the recommended dietary allowance, somebody that weighs 50 kilos needs 40 grams of protein a day, to be nitrogen balanced and not to have deficiencies. Now, if you are a fruitarian, no leafy greens, no nuts and seeds, nuts, sprouts, not tofu, nothing, just fruit, you can barely achieve the 40 grams of protein per day. Just do the math. If you go to Chronometer or My Fitness Pole or any other uh, internet tool that tracks your calories and nutrition, enter your fruit consumption during the day if you're a fruitarian, and you're gonna see that hardly you will reach 50 grams of protein per day, especially if you're a man. If you're a man, you're not going to multiply 0 0.8 grams per 50 kilos because a man probably weighs 70 kilos or, or 80 kilos, depending on your size. So a fruitarian person, even if it, regardless if it's a woman or a, or a man, uh, is going to fall short on protein if they only base their, diet, their diets on fruit only. And let's just say some people are very heavy into watermelon fasts and things like that. Yeah, you know, as a cleanse, do it. As a fast, do it. But don't go like, you know, for weeks and months because it's going to malnourish you. And if you eat, let's say, a day of watermelon, how much watermelon can you fit in your body? Can you ingest? If you take into account that a huge watermelon, like those who are like this and that you can carry like a baby, those watermelon probably weigh like eight kilos. And if you put that in chronometer, and you enter the amount of protein that is in a watermelon. Actually, let's do the math here. I have the chronometer app, so let's open it. So I wanna search for watermelon and I put watermelon raw and it gives you the option to put how much, grams, etc., etc. So a watermelon that weighs probably, uh, I don't know, I would say seven kilos, that would be 7,000 grams. So that's what I'm gonna put here, 7,000 grams of watermelon Okay, I'm not lying to you. And I'm going to probably put like a screenshot. So you can see right here. 7,000 grams is going to give me 42 grams of protein. So I doubt that somebody can ingest seven, seven kilos of watermelon just to get 40 grams of protein. That's not sustainable, especially if you have fitness goals. So what I was trying to explain to Eva is that the dietary recommendations for protein for the general population is 0 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight. This is just the minimum requirement not to lose nitrogen, not to lose protein. And protein is not just for muscles. I mean, by uh, at this point, I feel like everybody should understand that we're made of protein. Our bones are protein, our muscles are protein, our joints, our ligaments, our hair, our nails, our teeth, uh, all the things, the collagen, right? Collagen in our body, Everything that gives structure is made out of protein. And protein is not only to give you uh, structure in your body, it also has functions like enzymes and other things on a daily on, on a daily basis. There are so different biochemical processes that happen in your in your body, in your liver, in your kidneys, in your brain that need protein just to keep you alive. The body recycles protein uh, and amino acids, but those have different functions. And the ones that are gonna go destined to build muscle, it's an extra requirement. So if you work out and with every workout, you break down muscle fibers, the body's gonna say, okay, there is a wound, right? Because with every workout, you basically break muscle uh, fibers. The body's wise and says, you know what? There is a wound right here that needs repair. Let's send more protein to repair the, the, the breakdown of that muscle. What do you think is gonna happen if you, do not increase the protein. If you're working out like me or like anybody who wants to build muscle, 
What do you think is going to happen to the other organs and tissues that require protein just to function normally, just to grow your hair, just to grow your nail, just to keep your collagen, just to keep your teeth, your bone? What, what do you think is going to happen? So that's my point. And if it wasn't important to me, because it's important to me, I can see I can see how I'm going to end up if I don't make dietary modifications to fulfill my protein requirements because I'm working out hard. So this is my invitation to you. Reconsider that um, not everybody wants to just live a very shallow, very, uh, you know, stress-free life. I mean, ideally, everybody should be like in paradise, right? Not to worry, just waking up and going to bed with the sunset and just, you know, cutting mangoes from the tree and drinking coconut water is ideal. But that's not what the majority of, pe majority of people are living currently. Like we have a different reality, unfortunately. Um, so just to fulfill the demands of a heavy workload at your job, on top of that, to fulfill the the requirements of protein just for your daily activities, moving, going to the car, walking, taking a shower, carrying stuff, whatever, you know, in your house you do. And on top of that, if you want to build muscle, I feel like it's super important to increase the protein. That's my take. I think that some people can survive without doing anything and just keep eating fruit and things like that. But in my opinion, uh, I feel like other organs and structures in their body probably are going to suffer the consequences of that deficiency. I recently did a DEXA scan. A DEXA scan is an, similar to an MRI, but it's probably a different technology that evaluates the composition of your body. So I recently did one and my bone density is on point. I'm fine. I don't have osteoporosis or osteopenia. Um, my muscle mass has substituted the, the, the adipose tissue. So right now um, I'm good. Before, I didn't like the, the way that my body was looking uh, because I was doing cardio only, meaning running, and I didn't worry about protein. So I was adopting, as Viga said in the video, the skinny fat look, but now I modify my diet, I modify my workouts, and my body has recomposed. And it's evident in the DEXA scan. So I own you a video about my lab results after 10 years of veganism and the DEXA scan results after that one year long where I modify my diet as a higher vegan to include more protein. So somebody asked me in the comment section when I, when I shared this post on Instagram, oh, you should have done that DEXA scan before you modify your diet, right? When you were exclusive raw vegan eater for five years, you should have done a DEXA scan. Well, it was not in my radar. I was not worried because I didn't, I didn't go to the gym. I just, I just run. <laughs> that was my sport, basically. But now that I go to the gym and I modify my diet, I said, well, let's see that my body is recomposing. Let's see if uh, I'm losing fat and I'm gaining muscle mass. Let's see how are my bones. And the DEXA scan results were great. So this person was saying it should have been ideal if you could compare how your DEXA results look before modifying your diet, before increasing the protein, before going to the gym to see how you're doing. My response, my response to that person and to anybody who would like to see how they're doing in their fruitarian or low protein diet um, is to do it yourself. It's not that expensive. I mean, if you live in the US and if you have the earning capacity of a first world country, if you go to those places that do the DEXA scan, it's probably less than $100. So it's a good thing. I feel like at this moment, we not only need to rely on blood work, but also scan and see and see how is the body composition that you have. So do it. I encourage you to do it so you know how your body is behaving according to the diet that you are ingesting, uh, because I feel like it's important. So let's keep watching. Andrum, as to but you're saying you can be 100% raw and get enough protein. You just have to be a little higher fat then. Uh, no, not higher fat, but uh, okay. Yeah, higher fat than 10%, right? Higher than 10%. Uh, if you increase, if you're strategic in terms of which fats uh, you consume, we're not going for avocados. We are not going for, I don't know, uh, almonds. No, you need to, as I said, always in my, in my content, track yourself. That's the only way to know what you're eating and how much nutrition is giving you. So the best sources for protein without really increasing the um, omega-6s is uh, hemp seeds, I will say. The yeah. whole hemp seeds is going to give you plenty of protein, like three tablespoons or four, around 30 grams of hemp seeds gives you like around, I don't know, seven to 10 grams of protein. So by increasing that, obviously you're going to go up in the fat, but uh, you can also increase, increase the greens. And that's why so many rabbis say you need to eat one and a half pounds of greens. Yeah. Because that's that's how it works to, to provide you with, we were discussing before, one head of romaine lettuce, it has yeah. seven to 10 grams of protein depending on the size of the lettuce. So if you're going to eat three heads of romaine lettuce per day, you're getting probably 
25 grams of protein. Yeah. So if you're eating three spoons of hemp seeds, there's another 10. We have 35. All the fruit that you eat throughout the day is going to give you around 20 grams of protein. And all yeah. the vegetables, you know, zucchini has more protein than cucumber. Yeah. Things like that. Broccoli. Broccoli is relatively a good source of protein. I mean, one cup gives you probably three grams of protein to five. Yeah. So it's really, it really requires more planning if you want to keep it raw. Since I yeah. like to eat plenty of raw food, moderate amount of fruit right now, and I don't want to keep it high fat, I rather focus on cooked or heat processed sources that are still yeah. plant based and give me a ratio that is higher in protein than the calories. So if people want to go high raw, tempeh is a great source. Um, mm -hmm. Tofu, some people dislike it. You know, I don't have a problem with non GMO organic tofu, I think it's great. Um, and then lentils have more protein than beans. Lentils have more protein than quinoa, for example. Quinoa has more carbs, more calories. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if you really want to reduce the amount of, of fats, I will go with the high raw version, which for me works perfectly because yeah. at the end of the day, I'm still keeping it high carb, low fat. Animal protein is superior. So is, is plant-based protein the same as animal protein? Are we getting the same benefits? Yeah, yeah I guess. Yeah, yeah, the debate comes because um, it's uh, coming from the bodybuilder uh, community or the fitness community. So the fitness community, bodybuilder community who are uh, heavy into animal products, they say that animal protein is superior because, first of all, it's keeping your protein requirements on check without going extra on the carbs, for example. So oh. steak, chicken breast, they don't they don't have carbs, almost nothing. So still they're eating 100 to 200 calories, but they're getting 30 or 20 to 30 grams of protein. So that's why they say it's superior in, in that regard because it keeps you leaner, right? So to speak. Oh. At the end of the day, being lean is not eating excess calories. So it's easier for a carnivore and omnivore to plan a fitness uh, nutrition uh, program uh, and fitness program and, and just you know rely on the protein from animal products. That's the superior, so-called superior aspect. The other aspect is that animal protein doesn't have fiber. Therefore, the absorbability, availability uh, of protein and amino acids I explained this already. Mm -hmm. I'm with you on that. My goal was raw vegan. Now my goal is health because I'm aging and I'm losing muscle mass. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got to do something about this. So do some people need more protein than others? Is that maybe a thing where some people can, because I got a newsletter the other day from a very well-known raw vegan lady who was saying you only need about 15 grams of protein. I'm like, that seems really low. Maybe some people can get by with such a little bit of protein, but is only that? 15? Yeah. Wow. She was saying, don't wow. worry about it. She's an influencer. Uh, 15 grams is plenty. Mm. Okay. So is that a thing that maybe some people don't need as much and some people might need a lot more or, or are we all kind of like? I don't know, obviously depending on weight and, you know, male, female, whatever it is, how much you weight, that's how they base the RDA. But do you think that maybe some people just can't get away with a lot less protein? Well, first of all, I think whenever you mention numbers, you need to cite the sources. So I'll be curious to know what are the sources because the current RDA recommendations and it's an official guidelines, academics of nutrition and, you know, all the all the information that we get from uh, uh, health authorities, so to speak, and not necessarily health, health authorities, but, you know, yeah. the scientists that have made those determinations based on nitrogen balance studies, they came up with the RDA or uh, recommended dietary allowance, that's the acronym, um, with a 0 0.8, that's the number, 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilo of body weight, which is similar to 0 0.36 grams of protein. So I think I explained that. Let's keep watching. Yeah, what can I do in the vegan version? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I have all the answers in the vegan version, but what I'm doing right now is serving me and I'm seeing the results in my in my games, my body recomposition. Uh, we can talk about it if you want, but my body's changing. I'm no longer skinny fat. So yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. How long have you been uh working with this with the weight and since you changed your diet? Like how soon did you saw results? Because I'm still not seeing a lot of results, I have to say. And that's probably tight. So um yeah, she's talking about not having results on her current diet. And I explained to her that there are studies that show that after working out, you need to ingest not less than 30 grams of protein as a post-workout meal. Our vegans higher risk for certain diseases. So we discussed some other topics, but I really wanted to expand more on the topic of protein. Vitamin D, because I supplement, okay? So the vitamin D is okay. Vitamin B12 levels are okay. Uh, it's fine. So maybe we can make another video. I'm discussing my blood work. I'm going to make a video out of it. Um, but I wanted to mention something about protein. I've seen so many raw vegans say, oh, look at my blood work. Albumin, globulin, protein is unchecked. And I think I needed to expand more on this. When we look at the blood work that measures the amount of globulin and immunoglobulins and albumin and things like that, the blood work shows that the protein levels are okay. That's not evidence to say that you have a good amount of protein in your body because the amount of protein that you have in your circulation is a constant. If you don't have enough protein in your circulation, you're going to get swollen. You're going to get edema because... Proteins serve a mechanism that is called oncotic pressure. And oncotic pressure means that proteins have a different charge and a different molecular structure that makes it pull water and keep water and fluids and blood right, and lymph and everything that goes in our circulation. The protein basically pulls the fluid inside the blood vessel. Otherwise, if we are suffering from protein deficiency, right, you have edema. And in the past, it was called quashorpor because that means that you, that you don't have enough protein in your body that not even your body is capable to keep up with the oncotic pressure that is a constant when you have good nutrition. So that's a thing. You will never see protein deficiency in a blood work, but there are certain things and clues that you can check within your body and say if you're protein deficient or not. Meaning 
Are you struggling to put on muscle mass, right? Some people say, oh, you just need to eat more, more calories and don't worry about protein, plants are protein. Yes, but if you have been following that advice and you're not seeing results, uh, that's one parameter that you can use. Like, you know what, despite increasing my calories, like everybody's telling me, despite working out like crazy, I'm not able to retain muscle. Uh, you know what's going on? That's an indication that probably you're not ingesting enough protein. Another thing that is more subjective has to do with the structure of your body. When you are losing weight, are you losing muscle as well? The only way to know, I would say, is through a body scan, a DEXA scan. And that's going to tell you the percentage of lean body mass that you have, which is muscle and bones and tendons, versus the percentage of body position that you have, including subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. And there's no other way around it, unfortunately. So that's a good test to do if you really want to see how you're doing. Uh, another indication that probably you are suffering from protein deficiency has to do with the quality of your skin, the quality of your nails, the quality of your hair, the quality of your teeth, and the quality of your bones. Again, a DEXA scan is going to tell you, and there are all the types of testing, but I did a DEXA scan because it gives you like a breakdown of all these components of my body. But if you are suffering from osteoporosis and the step before osteoporosis, which is called osteopenia, if you are, if you are having those, maybe, you know, maybe you need to increase the protein. And obviously for bone health, there's other components like parathyroid hormone and vitamin D and calcium and phosphorus uh, metabolism and so many other things. But if you take a look at the histology of bone and how bone is formed, bone is not just minerals, you know, bone is basically, there is a mold, there is like a, what's the name, scaffolding of protein in order for the minerals to deposit on it. So collagen is a protein that is, there are different types of collagen. One is a collagen in our bones, one is a collagen in our, in our cartilage, one is a collagen in our subcutaneous connective tissue and so on. So there are clues for you to say, like, if you're protein deficient or not, if you look at your body and if you make an honest review, like the hair, the quality of my hair, the quality of my skin, the quality of my nails, the quality of my bones, the workouts are not working. I'm not, it doesn't seem that I'm gaining anything. That's a good start. Let's just keep watching. I'm just curious, have you noticed any major differences besides your body recomposition changing? So I'm going to make a video about the pros and cons of a high row vegan diet. One thing, so men can probably get along or get away without. Oh yeah, she asked like, she has been seeing plant-based influencers saying that you don't have to worry about protein. And we were discussing that most of these people, if you are saying to your audience that there is no need for protein, probably if somebody that looks like you and has the same gender, the same activity levels, the same gender and the same age, yeah, maybe they're going to get the same results. But I wouldn't recommend a particular dietary advice for uh, protein requirements to a woman who is 60 years old. That's not that's not going to work. Or a woman who is perimenopausal, that's not going to work. Especially men. Men have more testosterone. Testosterone is an anabolic hormone. Anabolic hormone means that builds up, makes something grow. That's why people who go to the gym and uh, they probably inject some steroids, they're called anabolics because it enhances the protein synthesis to have more muscles. Those who are called clean, that means on the fitness bodybuilding communities, when somebody's clean and they are athletic, they say, no, I don't use steroids. You know, it's just diet and workouts. But if somebody injects anabolic steroids, that means that they're getting a modified version of testosterone to keep them enhanced, the muscle growth and the muscle gains. So it's not the same if a man comes and tells you, oh, you know, you don't need, you don't need protein. Look at me. You know, I'm very muscular. Well, if you're a man, you have more testosterone than a woman. We have testosterone as well, but little amounts. So if you will, normal ranges of testosterone, 30 year old man, they're going to have certain values. And if you will, normal values of testosterone in a woman that is 30 years old, you're going to see a huge difference. We women have a hundred to a thousand times less testosterone than a man. So by mere anatomy, physiology, and biology, men are going to have more testosterone and more ease. They're going to put on muscle mass easily than a woman. And if a woman influencer comes and tells you don't have to worry about protein, etc., it's usually younger women. It's usually younger women. We have more estrogen. Estrogen uh, is a hormone that also uh, functions to keep our body structure in a nice way, functioning properly because we're young. So I haven't seen 
anybody past 40, past 40, past 50, past 60, that has worried about recomposing their bodies, which is a, a, a term that is not so old. It's kind of new. Recomposing your body, uh, keeping on muscle mass, reversing osteoporosis, avoiding osteopenia and sarcopenia. All of these things that we didn't worry before are kind of new, but are important. So yes, aerobic and diet exclusive is amazing for people to reverse certain conditions. But my invitation would be to consider all these things and make modifications so you don't suffer the consequences of malnutrition. And sadly, we see many people that disregard this information and they just go with the current and they, they just basically pay attention to whoever they want to listen to. And obviously, if you don't agree with my content, you're going to pay attention to the people that you resonate more with. And yeah, it's very convenient to just say, we're vegetarians, we don't have to worry about anything else. Uh, it's not that complicated. Um, unfortunately, I would love that it's not that complicated, but it's not straightforward. Otherwise, we wouldn't see so many raw vegans abandoning the lifestyle. And let me make a prediction here. I think it's going to keep happening if we don't address the possibility that maybe some people are not following a raw vegan diet the right way. There is no right way because humans are complex creatures and there's a lot of variables that affect our lifestyle and diet is only just one factor. You have to consider so many other things as we were saying, gender, activity levels, uh, age, and so many other factors. In my first newsletter, I describe all these reasons my second newsletter also has a lot of pearls of information that tell you why, why I'm so strong and opinionated about this topic and why my conviction was strong enough for me to take away my roving and doctor uh, image, take away that. And now I go with the things that I consider important. I supplement. I always encourage people supplementing with vitamins. Uh, we discussed more about that in this video. I think I'm going to discuss more about that on the video I make regarding my let me let me pause it here. I'm going to make another video discussing all these things. I'm going to make a summary of the second newsletter, which is things that I no longer do. I no longer recommend as a former exclusive raw vegan eater. I'm going to make another video revealing my lab results after 10 years of veganism and also including my DEXA scan. And probably I'm going to break down the importance of each vitamin for which I supplement. So that was a long video, but I really wanted to, to make clear certain topics. I hope you like it. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share this video. If you're interested in reading the newsletter number two, uh, subscribe. It's on my website. The links, all the links that I mentioned are in the description box. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.